All right, what is up, everybody? Time for another weekly Wednesday Q and A. Um, I am doing this off my phone today, unfortunately. So hopefully the quality is still as good, if not actually a little better. Um, so once again, uh, this is another weekly Wednesday edition of Q and A. Uh, what I have been doing over the past couple weeks is putting out a status about midday, um, asking people to ask me certain questions, um, and then I answer them uh, during the session here. So let's get this camera set up. I have the questions on my computer, um, and I had some roll in on Instagram too, so I'll make sure to cover those. Uh, but let's start things off uh, with the first one here. So let me go to the status, and we'll get it going. <coughs> All right. So well, thank you for tuning in, um, Matt. I think you just commented on the post, um, but here we go. So Steve, all the way from the UK, what's up, Tommy? Uh, Steve asked some great questions, and we are going to get into those right now. And for those of you who don't know Steve, uh, you should check him out on Instagram and Facebook. Revive Stronger is Steve. Uh, Steve Hall is his full name. Uh, but Steve asked me. Um, my approach to training during peak week. He asked a couple questions, so we'll get to those. Um, but first and foremost, he said approach to training during peak week. All right, so my overall uh, approach to train during peak week has always been to take it down a few levels. Um, I think a lot of people tend to uh, try to do too much in the last week to try to like really finish off their physique. You know, they're blasting themselves in the gym and uh, that's definitely not what I want to see. Um, so a definite step down. Uh, so by a step down, I mean you're definitely going to want to control the total volume. So hopefully leading into peak week, you know what kind of volume you're doing. And oh man, my phone's falling. Um, <laughs> so if you know what kind of volume you're doing leading into peak week, hopefully we have a rough estimate of that. Uh, we want to do a definite step down just because we know that it takes you know, anywhere from 36 to 48 hours to recover fully. And the last thing that I want to do is my athletes being sore, you know, the day or two before hitting the stage, especially for bodybuilders who have to basically flex every single muscle in their body. Uh, we don't want them to be fatigued going in. So, uh, Steve, uh, to kind of wrap this one up simply, I would say I, I decrease, uh, volume, especially, uh, training, uh, in the order um, I guess I would want to get legs out of the way early, especially, um, I mean, for bodybuilders, for figure athletes, even bikini. Uh, what's up, Alex? Crush it, man. Uh, so you want to get legs out of the way early. I think everyone pretty much does that just so there's no inflammation. Hey, Ashley, thanks for tuning in. Um, so you want to get legs out of the way early. And then I go back and then I kind of go by smaller muscle groups um, as the week goes on. Because uh, the bigger ones take longer to recover, the smaller ones don't. Um, so I kind of go in that in that way. You know, if I had to say, I would usually train legs, then back, then like a push, a pull, and then a full body uh, workout. And by pull, it might just be arms uh, by then uh, if you already trained back earlier. So by the end of the week, it's just really simply. Um, and then Friday. I typically have everybody do like a pump workout depending on how they're looking. Um, if they're looking a little bit uh, like they're spilling over, I might actually have them do like a couple pump sessions in a day just to really uh, push those carbs where they need to go. Uh, if they're looking according to plan, some, sometimes on Friday, you know, they just do a brief circuit in the morning um, and then that's it. So uh, basically very minimal training as the week goes on, maybe hard training. Uh, Monday and Tuesday, hard training. And then as far as the cardio goes, um, I would, I pretty much cut out all cardio um, Wednesday or Thursday for sure. Preferably Wednesday if possible, once again, just to help with uh, any inflammation in the legs. We don't want that to be there. So I cut that out uh, as early as possible. Still sticking with Steve's questions. Uh, he was going to make me work tonight, he said. So uh, he got a few, and I'll make sure to get to every one. I'll try to keep it about you know roughly a half hour like I've been. All right. Uh, Steve also asked, the approach to food, water, sodium on show day, uh, anything you do that isn't conventional. Uh, well, Steve, I don't know necessarily what is considered conventional anymore. 
I know what the the theory was a long time ago, um, but I know that we're on the same page. But I'll t I'll tell you uh, basically what I do. So really, on show day itself, first of all, the the carb load should are basically already be taken care of. Um, if you're st <laughs> if you're still trying to load um, like right before you step on stage, you did your carb load wrong. Um, so really, show day itself. You should just be um, reinforcing what you did the day before or even two days before, depending on your, your method. Um, so I always have my athletes, depending on what time they're going on stage, eat two or three meals. Um, and, and it's going to vary in size depending you know, how big those meals are going to be. Um, so that's for food. Uh, water, once again, water is going to be and taken in the majority the day before. So if you're taking in, you know, if you're a bodybuilder and you're going to take in six, seven hundred grams of carbs, um, that's where you're, the majority of the water is going to be. Uh, once again, you don't necessarily want to be just pounding your gallon of water the day of the show. And I'm not telling you to cut out water because we still need to push the carbs uh, into the muscle. Water still needs to be present. Uh, but I really don't like you chugging a ton of water on show day itself. And, and I, this really throws off a lot of people when I put it on their, on their peak week plans. Um, but I just say for the show day, drink as you're thirsty. And people tend to like freak out about that. They're like, well, what does that mean? Basically, that means just drink like you normally would. You know, if the show is at 9 o'clock in the morning, you know, you should roughly know how much water you're going to intake by 9 o'clock on your average day. Don't force it. Don't cut it out. Um, just try to keep things normal. I think a lot of people try to do crazy stuff uh, with water uh, during peak week itself and especially on show day itself and the day before. And then it's Steve Sodium, the last one. Um, I do a little bit differently uh, stuff with sodium on show day itself. So once again, I mean a lot of the sodium is going to be taken, um, what did Matt say, show day. If you eat, drink water at the same time, easy rule of thumb. Yeah, basically. Um, yeah, Matt said, and good point, Matt, that if you're going to be eating, I mean, just drink. You know, I, that's it's pretty much a no-brainer. But I think, like, I think a lot of people tend to really overthink. Uh, hey, Karen, thanks again for tuning in. I think a lot of people really tend to overthink show day. Um, really, all the work should be done. Like, show day should be really the least stressful. If anything, like the day before the show, like getting all that food in, I found is like the most stressful for me, especially if you're, you know, doing a crazy huge carb load, you know, having to sit down and eat and drink all that water. Like that's a lot more stressful than just kind of eating a few meals on show day and showing up. But anyway, Steve, to get back to your question, um, sodium, one thing that I do on show day, especially for bodybuilders, uh, just to give that little extra vascularity. Um, we, we do take a little bit of hit of sodium right before. What's up, <laughs> Jacob? Um, oh, Matt said overthinking is his favorite. Yeah, definitely, Matt. Uh, anyway, Steve, sorry to get to the question. We do take a little bit of sodium, about a, uh, a, a, a fourth uh, teaspoon of sodium uh, right before, I think it's a teaspoon, whatever the, the smallest one is, just one, basically one serving of sodium just to help bring out a little bit of vascularity, help with the pump up, basically like 30 minutes before we go on stage. Um, that's just to help with a little bit of increased blood flow to help you know get, get the pump going. Um, all right, Steve, one last one from Steve, and I swear I'll, I'll get onto it and all these other ones. All right, so Steve also, last question from Steve, said the best Best ways to objectively assess progress, um, the physique in the final weeks of contest prep when the scale data is less useful. Well, Steve, I know that you're definitely uh, in the last weeks of contest prep, so maybe that's why you asked this question. Um, but I'm going to put this out there, and I, I hope a lot of people saw this. Um, and I can try to tag it uh, in the comments below or after if somebody wants to see it. I mean, all you got to do is look up the guy. It's Al Alberto Nunez. For those of you who follow natural bodybuilding, obviously you've probably heard of Alberto. Uh, he is also going through a contest prep right now. And I saw a picture he put up on Facebook and Instagram the other day. And it was him at 161 pounds a few weeks ago, I believe. and uh, Or no, 160 pounds a few weeks ago. And then like the other day, he was 161 pounds. And in the 161-pound picture, he looked a lot tighter, a lot bigger than he did 
um, in the 160. So if you go off of the scale only, that's when you could really screw yourself up. Uh, so as contest preps, yeah, Alberto is crazy shredded. <laughs> uh, as the contest prep goes along, I go from more from like having people send me their weights and like initially like that's off season, like bare minimum weight to as the contest prep goes on, you know, pictures every now and then, you know, as we start to lose weight, you know, let's say like once a month. And then as the, the show gets closer and closer and closer, um, it's definitely pictures every week. And then a few, maybe like two weeks out uh, for some people, for sure that last week it's pictures every day. Um, but even some people, you know, a couple weeks out, it is pictures every other day or even daily because then, um, you know, there's going to be fluctuations in our weight depending on our sleep, our stress, the amount of water, the amount of sodium that we even take in. So I do try to limit those factors and I try to hold sodium roughly the same uh, during the final weeks just so there's no undulations and we can really keep things under control. You know, there's no surprises. Um, so really, I would say the amount of pictures taken closer to the show happens a lot more. And that we, I do a lot more visual feedback than anything. And I, I, I throw like the weight on the scale kind of out the window. Um, although I still keep it in the back of my mind, um, that is not the first thing I look at. The first thing I look at is definitely the pictures. All right, so Steve, <laughs> thanks for making me work hard on that one. All right, Leah asked a couple of questions, um, so we'll get to those. She said, what is your opinion on HIT workouts? Should they uh, be done on their own, or is it okay to do a HIT and lift on the same day? That's a great question. Um, so that is gonna be um, varying person to person, Leah. Now, what I've noticed, at least for myself and what I've seen in uh, some of my clients, is that HIT tends to be very taxing for some people. Uh, just because it is very similar to weightlifting if you're doing it right. And especially if you're actually doing true HIIT training where you're basically going to your max heart rate uh, for as long as you can and then dialing back off. Uh, it can be very taxing and the recovery time from HIIT um, is not as good as MISS or LIS, which would be moderate intensity or low intensity steady state cardio. Uh, so can you do a HIIT workout um, on the same day as you train, yes, you can. Uh, just be aware that it may affect your recovery. Um, if you're going to do a hit session, you know maybe space it on a day where you're intaking more carbohydrates, um, or you know after a, a high carb day like that. If you're going to do both, uh, just be aware that you know it might really tax you a lot. And then uh, two. This is her second question, Leah's second question. It says, sometimes I find it hard to get my daily carbs and I've uh, been recommended to have bagels. Uh, are bagels a good choice? All right, so yes, bagels are very uh, dense in carbs. Um, and I actually shot a video on this today. I did not edit it and post it yet. Um, for those of you who are turning in, I'm gonna I'm gonna post it soon, uh, maybe tomorrow, probably Friday, uh, about basically budgeting your daily macros. So someone that has a ton of macros or not enough uh, macros, you know, you have to really allocate per meal. And let's say you know if you're not if you find it hard to get in uh, some of your 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 carbs. You know, maybe try to space them out uh, for your meals. Maybe that you know, might be a better idea. For me personally, I mean, I'm a huge carb guy, so I could eat all the carbs in the world. Now, everyone's different, um, so yeah, I mean, bagels would be great. You know, other things that are that are high in carbs that go down easy. You know, any kind of cereal, any kind of bread, pasta. I mean, uh, you know, you could have a serving of pasta and knock out, you know, 42 grams of carbs. You could have a bagel and knock out 50 grams of carbs. You could have cereal knock out 50 grams of carbs and that's that's not really a lot so i think um just finding foods that are a little bit denser you know if you don't if you don't care to eat carbs um i don't really like to see people drinking their carbohydrates and we're going to get to that a little bit later um as far as the glycemic index actually the next one because lydia asked that um all them carbs go straight to the pipes jacob said yeah dude that's why i have uh 18 inch guns and all the carbs go straight to my 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 pipes um I don't like to see people drinking all their carbs because I feel like uh, the absorption rates might not be as good. Um, I'd rather see 
you know, you eat them and just keep you more sustained for a little bit longer. That's just personal preference. Um, people have a hard time getting carbs. How? Yeah, Matt, you're in prep, so I can understand that. All right, Lydia is, we're going to cover glycemic index now. And I know where Lydia's coming from. Um, she worked me with me uh, during her last contest prep. And I do recommend a rough uh, glycemic index for people to hit. Now, a lot of people may uh, not agree with the glycemic index. And Lydia is tuning in right now. Thanks, Lydia. Um, but so to sum it up, the glycemic index is basically based off of um, the insulin spike you get from taking in a certain carbohydrate source. So a higher glycemic carb would spike uh, your insulin, your blood sugar, uh, more than a lower glycemic carb. Now, are high glycemic carbs bad? No. Are low glycemic carbs more optimal? Maybe. Um, just because, in my opinion, uh, the lower glycemic carbs and the middle gl moderate glycemic carbs take longer to digest. Now, and I do have to say this because this is how the studies are taken, are, you know, are executed. They take it when you're fasting. So let's say you don't eat or drink for, it's like 16 hours, and then you drink a cup of orange juice. Obviously, the insulin spike is going to be a lot greater. Uh, your blood sugar is going to spike through the roof. So technically, orange juice would be high glycemic. But when you pair a high glycemic carb with, like, let's say, a source of protein and some fat, the, the spike and the effect on your body is, is lessened. It, it almost negates the whole process of the high glycemic carb. And Lydia, where I think you're getting at is why I recommend this um, is basically because typically the higher glycemic carbs are higher in sugar. We digest sugar quickly. Um, the, I like to see lower to mid glycemic carbs because they tend to have more fiber. They tend to take longer to break down. They tend to keep us fuller over time. So that is why I tend to, you know, stick with the low to moderate glycemic carbs as opposed to the high. All right. Tommy, if you're still watching, we're going to get to yours right now. Um, how, ab Tommy said, how about the positive and negatives uh, to training or not training on refeed days. Will your body store more of the carbs if you train or don't? Ooh, that is a great question, Tommy. Um, so, you know, and that and that could go that could go really two ways. Um, if you are in an extreme deficit, you know, your body is primed to store food. Um, if you take an off day your body is pretty much going to absorb everything. Um, and that's why you see, um, that's why you see, um, sorry, I just saw Lydia's question. I'll get to that in a second. Um, that's why you see your weight jump up, you know, the day after a high carb day because you're holding on to all those carbohydrates and you're holding on to all that water. Now, are you going to be able to absorb more if you train or you don't train? Well, I mean, time, Tommy, you're going to use some of those carbohydrates technically if you are training on that day. I'm sure they could go to help you with your training session, so that may be a good idea. Um, honestly, if you're going to train or you're not going to, I mean, I would recommend you either train on your high carb day or the day after. Sometimes, um, and this is what I recommend for a few people, I've, I've done it myself, is either train your weakest muscle groups on the high carb day itself or the day after. Just because you, in theory, have more energy in your system, you can go a little bit harder. Um, so it's, it might help with performance, but I don't, you know, I don't have any research back studies on that one. Lydia, I will get to that. Um, so high glycemic carbs pre-workout only. Why is that? Because uh, they hit your system a lot quicker. So let's say you haven't eaten for like two or three hours, and you need a little bit of energy boost. Uh, those high glycemic carbs, basically in the form, you know, of simple sugars, dextrose, you know, like I do. Um, will be absorbed directly into the bloodstream and will help with performance. So that's why I do high glycemic carbs pre-workout only. All right, um, Matt, 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 Matt. Hopefully he's still watching too. Um, Matt asked me what, uh, so wait, Lydia asked, so what is uh, really the only time you'd recommend them? Yeah, yeah, pre-workout. Uh, pre 
Uh, basically, Lydia, pre-workout, um, intra-workout, and post-workout are really, the really only time I would recommend high glycemic carbs. Once again, really just to uh, get the carbs back into your system. Basically, to prime you for your workout, to help you get through your workout, and then to replenish the glycogen after. The order of importance goes, you know, basically pre, during, and then post. Um, you don't necessarily need high glycemic carbs post-workout. Uh, to help uh, boost recovery. It's shown that it may aid in it, but it is not 100% necessary. So that's why I tend to take out uh, the post-workout high glycemic carbs uh, first, and then I still leave in the, the pre-workout and the intra-workout you know, if we have room. But anyway, getting to Matt's question. Matt asked me, what is the b biggest mistake I've made while prepping, diet, training, etc.?" cetera? Um, so Matt, uh, I'll... I, this is a tough one. Uh, I would like to think that I, I don't make uh, many mistakes, but I, and honestly, I, I do. I mean, I, you know, I've been in the sport uh, since 2011. Um, and then, Jesse, I'm going to get to that one too because somebody actually asked me that earlier. Um, so, oh, Jacob, sorry. Uh, oh, oh, Jacob asked me another one. Anyway, I'll get to that too, Jacob. Sorry, there's two, two J's in a row. Anyway, uh, one of the biggest mistakes I have made, and this was when I first started, like in 2011, I prepped for my first show for a few weeks. Um, first, that was a huge mistake, uh, dieting, I like, crashed dieting for, uh, for three weeks. So that was mistake number one. And basically what I did, and even the second year, because it kind of goes hand in hand, because I really didn't know what I was doing the second year either. Um, even though I did, because I knew what macros were, but I went from basically eating everything in sight to just picking an arbitrary number and going to that. So for instance, I'll say um, I was eating maybe like 3,500 calories a day, 4,000 calories a day. And then I arbitrarily you know, went down to like 2,500 or 2,000 uh, just right away. You know, sure, I lost a lot of weight quick, um, but I was miserable. Um, so that I learned a lot <laughs> screwing up, um, but that was probably the biggest mistake I've ever made was just making a drastic cut to start a contest prep, and that was terrible. Um, the people that worked with me at the time probably hated me. Um, I, I'm actually still friends with some of them, surprisingly, um, but I was just super crabby all the time just because, you know, basically I crashed dieted myself into a show, and that was a huge mistake. All right. Um, uh, let's see here. I do want to get to Zach's question because it kind of ties in to Jesse's, uh, and that is with fat, uh, with alcohol. That's the second question. But anyway, I'm gonna get to the first one with Zach and then Jacob and, uh, Jesse, I'll get to yours. So Zach asked me, this was on Instagram, um, does stretching post-workout have a negative effect on muscle gain or basically recovery or performance or, or all of the above, he kind of asked me. So um, to start things off, I think we need to know how to properly stretch and, and what ways to use stretching to our advantage. Um, a lot of us know that if we do static stretching before we work out, it elongates uh, the tendons that are, that are connecting the muscle to the bone and that could actually have a negative effect on performance because of it overstretches it and it gets the elasticity out. And obviously, um, you know, like when we're going down into a squat and coming back out, uh, that's a lot of spring that is in our muscles that's actually, you know, getting us through the hole. Um, so I would say that we really need to do more dynamic movements beforehand so we don't lose the power uh, from our ligaments and our tendons. So getting back to the post-workout stretching, that's when you do the static type stretching, uh, the longer holds. And then, you know, does it have a negative effect? Absolutely not. Um, if anything, it has a positive effect just because it's going to force, you know, more blood into the muscle. It almost has like an occlusion uh, type of effect uh, on the muscle itself just because it, you know, it really, it stresses the muscle without being underweight. Um, if that makes sense. I mean, because there's different ways to fatigue the muscle. Um, sorry, my phone's screwing up now. So yeah, I mean, if you're going to stretch afterwards, I would say definitely static. You know, don't take it to the extreme like you're going to pull a muscle afterwards just because you are fatigued and, you know, you don't want to overdo it. But take it to a point where it feels slightly uncomfortable 
you know, and hold it there for, for 10 to you know 30 seconds, depending on how much you can handle. And really, it should aid in recovery. I don't think there's any negative effect. Uh, you know, you, you might overdo it, um, but I think you know, you're you know you're gonna know when you're overdoing it if you start to feel too much. And then Zach's second question, which Jesse, it kind of ties into yours: um, alcohol during the off season. So I'll just kind of talk about uh, alcohol in general. Um, I will say first and foremost, I have actually never had a sip of alcohol in my life, so um, I I don't really see the points. Um, of drinking, I'll be honest. Um, but uh, in your off season, can it hurt you? No, not necessarily. I mean, drink in moderation. Um, I don't think that it's going to have any negative effect on muscle gain. You know, some people will say, uh, you know, that it, bl it blunts protein synthesis, and sure, it you know it might have qualities that do that. You know, but Zach, I mean, you're, you're a young, fit guy. Um, I don't think you're going out every single day and binge drinking. You know, I, I know I can't speak for you, but you don't seem like the kind of guy that would. Um, when, uh, when you do do that, um, binge drinking, I mean, or just drinking in excess a lot over time, uh, you know, it, those calories definitely add up. And I think a lot of people think that, oh, you know, it's a, it's just a shot, or it's just a glass of wine, or you know, I'm just a few beers, and it's like alcohol. They think they uh, it doesn't. Uh, have calories, you know, it's just this magical potion that uh, just makes me feel good and there's no negative side effects, there's no calories to it and unfortunately, you know, that's just not true. Um, now, Jesse, during a contest prep, kind of sliding into your question now, um, same thing, you know, can you drink alcohol uh, in a contest prep? Sure, you know, why not? Would I recommend it? No, because why, why drink uh, those calories. Now, are you gonna? Can you get away with having, <coughs> you know, a beer or two, you know, a couple once a week, twice a week? Sure, if your calories are high enough. Um, but as the calories get low, and I, you know, I feel like a lot of people's calories do get get pretty low. Um, why allocate those calories to alcohol uh, when they could be going somewhere else? So no, I mean, I would definitely stay away. Uh, from alcohol during pron uh, contest prep, or six, Jesse says. Uh, hopefully you're not having six beers or in contest prep, dude. That would be a lot. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you could still get away with it. Everything in moderation. And once again, I, I really don't see the, the point to it. I, I haven't done it myself. Um, but I would stay away from it uh, the closer and closer you get from a show. Kind of like you know people do with their tracking. You know They might loosely track when they start, so that would be the time where you, know, you could still go out you know, and eat with your family and go out to restaurants and have a beer or two. And as you get closer and closer to the show, you, know, you probably should get away from all alcohol in general. You know, and some people it does it does have um, kind of a inflammatory effect. Uh, so you might it might cause you to hold a little bit more water. Um, so I would just forego that. Um, you know, I'm not going to put a number on it, but. As soon as the calories, you know, you really have to dig deep for calories, you shouldn't be consuming any alcohol, in my opinion. Um, uh, Jacob, I know that you asked me a question. I got to go back here, dude. Um, all right. <clears throat> Jacob asked me, when to know you're in need for a mini cut per mel? Oh, got it. Okay, I get it now. I get it. Um, <laughs> so... Um, Jake, that's a great question. And I think for a lot of people, um, they just feel fluffy. They don't like the way that they look, even though that's not a main driving factor. Um, uh, maybe they're feeling a little bit more sluggish. Uh, maybe they feel like they are gaining a little bit too much weight or they're gaining weight too quickly. Um, you know, a lot of people throw around the term, uh, insulin sensitivity, um, you know, whether you believe that or not, I mean, if you're really pounding your body uh, for carbs, with carbs for a very, very long time, um, you know, you can develop a slight uh, you know, insulin sensitivity if you're just eating too much. So, yeah, I mean, when do you know? Um, so, here's the thing. I mean, everyone's going to be different. Uh, you really have to consider how long you've already been in a surplus, um, if you need to stay in a surplus and when your next show is going to be. So I'll just use myself as an example. Um, basically, since 2015, I competed last in May of 2015, and I've been in a caloric deficit 
uh, probably three times since May of 2015. So I've done three mini cuts in two and a half years. Um, and that may sound like a lot. It's almost one mini cut a year um, just because where I'm at in my, in my career. You know, I need to try to gain as much muscle as possible. And it might be different um, for women uh, because they think they need to look a certain way for, for, for their boyfriends, for their husbands, um, not putting any pressure on you, Jacob. Um, but, you know, maybe they, they just feel like they need to look like they compete year round. Um, and I think that everybody needs to get away from that. And, you know, whether it's social media, you know, that gives us these standards, um, you really just have to remove yourself from it. So, you know, you don't, you don't feel like you always have to be stage lean. And whether, you know, this is her or not, uh, you, you, know, you try to get away from that and just realize what's best for you. Like, think to myself, is it best for me to go into another deficit right now? You know, is that going to play out for my long-term plan? Like, is it going to be beneficial? Or is going into a deficit right now... You know, is it not going to be beneficial? You know, what are the reasons that I want to go into a deficit? I think we have to look a little bit deeper into that. And then you could kind of decide for yourself, you know, if it is an appropriate time or do you actually need to go into a deficit? Jesse asked me, am I a fan of keto? To be short, no, I don't like keto. I think it is um, witchcraft, honestly. Um, but if you have like extreme conditions like cancer or Alzheimer's, studies have shown that it is beneficial. I think people uh, try to use keto as the greatest diet on the planet when really you know it's just creating you know a, a carb deficiency. You see a lot of weight loss in the first week because you lose the water that is stored with the carbs, and I think like that's why a lot of people are a fan of it. Um, so, you know, for everybody has their different diets. I don't really do keto for any of my clients. I don't, I don't feel the need for it. Um, some other people swear by it. I'm just not one of those guys. Uh, Tommy asked me another one. Tommy's still hanging around. Thanks, man. Um, is there a time in prep where you have to cut out core ABC? No, no. Um, Tommy, no, I don't think there's a time uh, that you have to cut out core ABC. And I think, I know where you're, where you're getting at because, uh, BCAs technically are protein. They do carry trace calories. Um, but as long as you are keeping track of your intake, you know, let's say you take three scoops of ABC per day. Personally, I take two, but let's say you're taking three or four scoops and you keep that steady over the course of the day, um, over the course of your entire prep, there's really no need to cut it out um, as long as you're keeping track of it. So let's say you're taking like a fish oil too, you know, core omega. Core omega has fat in it. As long as you keep it steady throughout the prep, I don't feel the personal need to keep that in your macros. Um, it's, just, it's just a supplement. You know, as long as you keep it steady, you don't need to account for it. You know, it's keep in the back of your head that, look, I need to be on this. I need to take four scoops or I need to take all these pills in a day. They don't count for my macros, but technically, you know, they do, you know, they do still carry calories. Um, still going here. Jacob, surplus since, ooh, hold on. Surplus since 2016, Mel, besides the last six weeks. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I mean, that, that is a great uh, span. You know, if you're in a in a surplus uh, for that long, you know that's plenty. You're you're, you're due for a mini cut. Um, you know, just whittle it down. Just don't extend it too long. Um, mini cuts, I would say, put a hard stop date to them. You know, whether it's 12 or whether it's 16 weeks, don't go any longer than 16 weeks. Um, you know, if you if you don't lose the weight in 16 weeks, uh, just cut it. You know, cut your losses and start building it back up because. You know, I know what Mel wants to do personally, uh, since I know her, and you know she really wants to potentially switch over to figure. Um, and figure is going to require a lot more muscle, uh, so you just have to keep in a surplus and keep slamming the weights. Um, it, it, that's just you know specifically for Mel. Um, so hopefully, you know she hears what I have to say. But um, I think she does great in bikini. But that's my two cents. All right, uh, Jesse. Um, um, you're crazy attractive and I'm just here watching you talk now. Thanks, Jesse. Recently married though, I appreciate that. Um, 
<laughs> um, Ashley, not sure if you touched on it, but I missed Bacardio prior competition related to Travin holding H2O. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I did touch that in Steve's uh, at the beginning of the video. Uh, but um, yeah, I do try to limit cardio, especially during peak week, uh, just because I feel like you can hold on to a little bit more water from the stress. So when, to wrap up Steve's question, I said cut it out um, like Wednesday or for sure Thursday of peak week. That way you aren't holding on to any, uh, any water. Uh, getting on to the next one here. Tina, how far out of stage weight, stage body fat do you recommend uh, for the off-season bikini? Uh, great question, Tina. For women, I like them. Um, and I've, I've, I've made multiple posts on this before. Um, but no more... It's not a body fat percentage because people look different, you know, at different body fat percentages. Um, but really, no more than like 20 pounds. Um, I feel like, you know, if it's a little bit more than 20 pounds, you know, we might have to do two different cuts with a with a gaining phase uh, in between. And I'm a big advocate of that now, and I think that's where a lot of people have been going wrong on their diets. Um, even myself, and and I'm really gonna hit on this next year when I go to compete. Is the the modern Contest prep diet is extremely flawed. Um, people are just wasting themselves away dieting for way too long. Um, so really, if you're going to do a one-shot, uh, two-stage, I would say no more than, than 20 pounds. For men, 25 pounds, uh, give or take. If you're any more than that, then you, you need to you know, take, uh, take it in you know, a couple mini cuts, two or three mini cuts leading into your show. For me personally, I'm actually, I already did my first phase one. And I lost, um, I went from 207 to 191. And then right now I'm like 193. I'm going to take it down again. And I'm going to build myself back up. And I'm going to take it down one more time from the next contest prep. So technically I'm going to do like three mini cuts into my show. And hopefully that's going to spare a lot of muscle. Um, and it's going to bring a package for me. Now for bikini, I think if you can do it under... 20 pounds, if you do it under 20 weeks, that's really the most I want to see anyone dieting for. You know, really 16, 16 weeks is the longest time I like to see people diet straight through because I feel like uh, just a lot of muscle loss happens after that. Uh, going on to the next one, uh, Jacob, 16 weeks of this without stepping on stage. <laughs> nah. <laughs> that's in regards to the mini cuts. Yeah, I mean, don't extend the mini cuts more than you need to. Uh, Jacob asks, what is your outlook on creatine monohydrate before workouts or post-workout most beneficial before workouts? Um, I, did, I have answered that question before, Jacob. And my opinion has always been if it is in your system, uh, it's going to be effective. So if you're taking anywhere from 5 to 10 grams a day, um, and I was actually just tagged in a great post if you want to go on my Facebook page today, uh, written by Slam, Sam Sloan out in Virginia. She was one of, my, uh, one of my clients. She works with the Nutrition Corners. I'm sure if you follow Natural Bodybuilding, you know her and Patrick are the Crusher couple. She put out a great article on that. I'm actually going to put a uh, link into your question. But just make sure it's in your system and then it will be effective. Uh, so there's that. Um, uh, Ashley said, oh, my phone is seriously just cut out from the whole response. LOL, I'll reply later. Okay. Um, Jacob said he normally takes it after. Um, Jacob, I mean, I take mine uh, before, but the only reason why I take mine before is because it's in my pre-workout. I mean, it's in, it's in Fury, uh, so I take it before, and I don't notice, you know, if I take it before or after really any difference. So make sure it's in your system, man. A minimum five grams a day, um, and you'll be good. And I did have one question, if I can move this over. Uh, roll in, I think, on um, Messenger here, if my computer will stop fucking up. Um, oh, that was a nice message from Erin. She just said, help inspire me. Yeah, no problem. Glad I'm inspiring people. All right, best message of the day. Uh... Say hi. Hey, how you doing? Uh, Tommy um, said, uh, my soreness seems to never go away right now. Yeah, Tommy, you are in a deficit, brother. Um, the soreness is, is going to be tough. Um, sleep is probably at a premium right now. So, I mean, you know, if you could really focus, and I know you got kids and you travel a lot. Um, so, if you could really work on your, your sleep, I would say that could help. 
Um, you know, taking some extra magnesium might help you. Um, a little bit of core Z's. Uh, you know, maybe all of the above. You know, make sure we are still stretching afterwards. We we covered that one earlier to help with recovery. Ashley, favorite pre-workout core fury. I've been taking that stuff for years, and I do not take anything else. Hence the crush it shirt. Man, questions are just rolling in now. All right, um, Brianna, do you take the same approach in weight loss and non-competitors as you do in competitors uh, with the amount of time you spend on cuts? Yes. Yes, I do. Um, for non-competitors, um, and everybody is different, but a lot of time, non-competitors typically tend uh, to carry a lot more weight, a lot more fat, I should say. They don't have as much muscle as competitors do. Um, so although I don't try to run non-competitors into the ground, I mean, I, I never want to do that. Um, I don't push them as hard as I do competitors because there's an indefinite amount of time that I could work with them. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I tend to go slower with non-competitors. You know, I, I don't have to meet a hard timeline. Uh, so with someone like yourself, you know, if we don't happen to lose the recommended amount of weight, you know, the one pound to two pounds a week that we shoot for every week, you know, if we don't hit it for, for one week, I'm not going to make an unnecessary cut. Uh, for a competitor who has a hard show date, you know, I'm going to have to make cuts so I could get them to the show. So yes, sometimes I will keep non-competitors in a deficit longer just because I don't have to make huge cuts. So technically, non-competitors sometimes end up eating more than my competitors uh, it just, you know, it's an individual situation. Eric, would you recommend a higher fat diet off season for type one diabetic uh, to make cutting easier? Ooh, man, Eric, that is a tough one. Um, I do, honestly, um, I'm not even gonna try to make up an answer for that one. I don't know, I'm not ashamed to say it. Um, I don't really know too much about uh, diets and diabetes. I mean, it makes sense to limit the carbohydrates um, just because the, you know, the insulin response is not as great, you know, if you were to have a higher carb diet, um, but I do not have a solid answer one on that. I'm sorry for you. Tommy said six week out. Ashley's cracking up. Um, uh, what did Jacob say? He said PR breaker. Yeah, buddy. Um, I don't know why I shared it again. I don't know Jacob either. <laughs> All right, uh, what do you recommend to build abs for a bikini competitor? All right, so my approach on abs uh, has always been a, a couple things. Um, first, you know, you still do want to have some kind of weighted movement uh, with your abdominals. So if it's some kind of weighted crunch, rope crunch, whatever, um, some kind of a tucking motion, um, and the tucking motion can can be limited. You know, just because gyms don't have a certain amount. Um, you know, I have an ab coaster at my gym that you could load the weights on. Uh, some people have ab rollers that really hits the lower abs nicely. And I, I don't really like using the term lower abs because, I mean, technically, if you're working your core, you're working your entire core. Uh, so I think that term is, is tossed around a little loosely. And then last but not least, some kind of stabilization movements, whether that's, you know, planks, or you know whatever kind of other yoga type movements you like doing. I try to incorporate all those. Um, I don't stick to one set movement uh, because you know, it gets kind of boring just doing crunches all the time. Um, I think another thing that a lot of people do not do uh, is brace their core when they are working out. So I think they don't properly brace it when they're squatting or when they're deadlifting, when they're just lifting in general. So I think just working on properly engaging your core all the time uh, while you're lifting will, will help build those muscles. Jacob said, thanks for the solid impro. No problem, man. I will talk to you soon. Tommy, uh, when are we going to get long sleeve iron management shirts, man? I don't know. Tommy, next year. <laughs> 2018, man. We got big things coming in 2018. Um, yeah, so we'll see. I think that was all the questions. I'm sorry if any extra ones rolled in um, on Instagram. I could not check it. Uh, since I am on my phone right now. If any did roll in on Instagram, I will get to those next Wednesday. And damn, this one uh, went 45 minutes. So great questions. Um, now that I've been doing these, I feel like a lot more people are tuning in. So I do appreciate those of you who stuck around and dealt with me for 45 minutes. Um, next week, same time, same place. 
weekly Wednesday Q&A. I appreciate everybody tuning in. Have a great night, and I will see all of you soon. Crush it!